The Holy Spirit is not simply a wonderful presence or a spiritual influence or some divine energy. Remember, the Holy Spirit is a person. When I say person, means he has personality. He's a person as real as Jesus. The Holy Spirit is God. He's equal to the Father in every way. To realize this personality of the Holy Spirit is of vital importance for our Christian life. If you think, listen to this, if you think of the Holy Spirit as a great power, like many Pentecostal Christians do, then your thought will be, how can I have more of the Holy Spirit? Because it's a great power. But if you think of the Holy Spirit as a person, then you will say, how can the Holy Spirit have more of me? What a difference that is. How can I have more of the Holy Spirit? That leads only to spiritual pride. But those who look at the Holy Spirit as a person, they will be used by the Holy Spirit according to His will. Dear Christian friends, why did God give us the Holy Spirit? It is the Holy Spirit who makes it possible for us to have a relationship with God. If God appears far from you, if there's a big gap between you and God, then you have to ask the Holy Spirit, please break down this gap. I want to relate to the Father. I want to love Him as my Father. I want to cry, Abba, Father. It is the Holy Spirit who does that. Without His ministry, we cannot even understand the Gospel. When are we then going to enjoy the Gospel? The excitement and the passion that we have, it's not theatrical. It is the Holy Spirit who makes it real. If not for the Holy Spirit, God will remain a mystery to us. Now there are many Christians who believe that the nine gifts of the Spirit and all the manifestations of Pentecost, including healings and tongues and miracles and prophecies, all that stopped in the days of the early church. Such a belief is called cessationism. But there are also others who believe that all that I mentioned, that is the manifestations, the healings, the tongues, the miracles, and the prophecies, all of that are still valid today. They are called continuationists, and such a belief is known as continuationism. Many are confused about prophecy, and particularly, there are so many who are confused about tongues. Some overemphasize tongues. Some downplay the importance of tongues. And that is why today we're going to study about speaking in tongues. It's a beautiful study, so give your heart and spirit fully to understanding what is being spoken. Saints of Holy Tarot. In the upper chamber, thirsting for the Spirit, all with one accord. Tons of fire descended, we shall e'er remember our Pentecost that brought the glory down. Saints of all they tarried in the upper chamber, thirsting for the Spirit, all with one accord. Fire descended, we shall ever remember our prophetic us that brought the glory down. Comforter divine, blessed Holy Ghost, promise of the Father, fill this waiting host, overcoming sin, overcoming sin.
purity with purity, joy to overflowing. This is Pentecost, comforter divine, blessed Holy Ghost, promise of the Father, fill this waiting host, overcoming sin, overcoming purity with purity, joy to overflowing. This is Pentecost. Father, we pray that you may really speak to us. Spirit of God, we need your help. Enlighten us and draw us deeper into the subject. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me state right at the beginning, speaking in tongues is from the Holy Spirit. It is not something that we must be worried about. If you lose the ability to speak in tongues, you are losing a God-given gift. Here is a fact that will instantly give you the assurance that speaking in tongues is the right thing. The greatest Christian who ever lived and knew the mind of God, St. Paul, an intellectually gifted theologian, prophet, apologist, made the statement that he spoke more in tongues than all in the Corinthian church. How did he make a statement like that? It's a sweeping statement. And he's thanking God. If speaking in tongues is wrong or even unnecessary, suppose it's just blabbering and not necessary, are you telling me that this apostle is indulging in something like blabbering, unnecessary thing more than everyone? And remember, it was Jesus himself who first taught about tongues. In Mark 16, 17, Jesus said, And these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall speak with new tongues. Jesus said it first, not Paul. The whole thing was designed by God the Father. Jesus foretold it. The Holy Spirit enabled it. And the church simply received it. But sadly, speaking in tongues has become a very controversial topic because it is wrongly practiced in many Pentecostal churches. Listen carefully. It takes time for a wrong practice to be established in the right church. It doesn't happen immediately. But if a wrong practice is not corrected, then little by little, over time, when left uncorrected, it will be established. And no one will see how far we have gone from the truth. When an entire body of Pentecostal Christians gather together and all are screaming in tongues, we would see that as a divine visitation, isn't it? But there is a verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place. Okay, is that right? The whole church come together in one place. Hmm. And all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned hmm. or unbelievers, Will they not say that ye are mad? Will they not think you are mad? Is, now you tell me. Is Paul encouraging the practice or is he actually discouraging the practice? Paul is clearly saying, if you all gather together in a place and you are all shouting in tongues and a new person walks in, will he not think you have all gone mad? So clearly in Paul's time, that was not a practice. Then how did it change? Little by little, little by little. You see, this is the importance of a church leader. 
If the church leader himself doesn't know the truth, he will be encouraging the people to go into the wrong practice. And so this has contributed to cessationism. People have had a strong pushback to these practices. Cessationists are not fascinated by tongues at all. In fact, they are repulsed by it. One pastor of an evangelical church said this. He said, even if God does eventually give me one of the gifts, I certainly don't want it to be tongues. That shows how much they hate tongues. Is it right to hate tongues? No. But see how Pentecostals have contributed to that hatred by wrong practice. Cessationists have conducted studies that show that speaking in tongues can easily be developed or it's a learned behavior. I agree with that. I have seen that happen. I have seen people speak in tongues into the ears of another person, forcing them to repeat those tongues. And when he does repeat it, he declares, you have received the Holy Spirit. How can you do that? You're teaching another person to speak it and you're saying he has received the Holy Spirit. Through hearing and observing others speak in tongues, a person can learn the procedure subconsciously. Then some persons can say, I didn't just speak, I felt something, I felt ecstasy, I felt such joy. Well, the human body produces adrenaline and endorphins when it experiences something new, exciting, and emotional. And I agree there also. It's easy to excite people by saying things and doing things. And when everybody is screaming in tongues, you can also have, a, it's called an adrenaline rush. And so many people, they interpret that feeling as the anointing. Many only copy tongues. I have seen people um, who come from a particular a village or a town or a particular part of a nation. They all speak the same tongues. How is that possible? Does the Holy Spirit do that? No. They are learning it from the others. Many speak in tongues mechanically. They have no relationship with the Holy Spirit at all. And that is why they can fall asleep while speaking in tongues. Some people open their eyes and they look around speaking in tongues. Some people, as soon as they sit in a meeting, they open their mouth, speak in tongues. All these practices have been fully accepted by many churches. Lack of sound teaching has made the whole topic of tongues like a derailed train. Chaotic, noisy, and in the end, a lot of casualties. There's a verse where Paul says that tongues will come to an end. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Oh, cessationists love this verse. That is 1 Corinthians 13. 8 and 10. Tongues shall cease when? When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Cessationists say there was a time when there was no written word. There was no Bible. At that time, people had to speak in tongues. But when the Bible was finally compiled, tongues ceased. That's how cessationists interpret this verse. But that is a wrong interpretation because when Paul says, when that which is perfect is come, he is speaking not of the Bible being compiled. Because further down, Paul says, when we see him face to face, tongues will cease. In other words, in heaven, there will be no tongues. Then cessationists immediately go to another verse. It's Paul's rhetorical question. 
Paul asks a question in 1 Corinthians 12, 30. He says, do all speak with tongues? What's the obvious answer when Paul says, do all speak with tongues? Your answer is no. So immediately they say that. This is why there must be proper teaching on tongues. I will answer this question later. The whole confusion about tongues comes from just one wrong understanding. If you understand what I'm going to say in the next 10 seconds, your whole confusion will end. And that is this. There are four different kinds of tongues that Paul teaches about. Not one, but four. If you don't realize there are four, you will be confused and you will confuse others. So I'm going to explain these four kinds of tongues and I've taken material from one particular pastor who explains it very clearly. There are a lot of teachers talking about tongues but they are shallow or they are erroneous. But this is very clear and you're going to enjoy it. If you have come here for a feast, you're going to get one. So are we ready? Okay. All right. There are four kinds of tongues. Two of them are public and two of them are private. So totally four kinds of tongues. We are now going to study the first one, public tongues. Public tongues are of two kinds. One, the gift of tongues, and two, tongues for interpretation. I'm going to explain this slowly so you can understand it clearly. First one, the gift of tongues. Here's a shocker for you. The gift of tongues is a sign for the unbeliever. Paul said, if the unbeliever comes into the church and you're all speaking with tongues, he'll think you're mad, right? But the same Paul says that tongues is a sign for unbelievers. Here is the verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 Verse 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. That's enough. Isn't that shocking? Isn't that confusing? So let me clear your confusion. Is he speaking about unknown tongues? Paul doesn't say unknown tongues. He says tongues are for a sign. Paul is speaking about known tongues, not unknown tongues. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, those who had gathered there, the Christians who received the Holy Spirit, they were all speaking in tongues the wonderful works of God. That is what is mentioned there in Acts 2. It says they were speaking the wonderful works of God in the tongues of the people who were watching, the people who were around. Here the Christians were speaking in their language. Now how do we know that Paul is referring to this event? You see, because that day the crowds understood the tongues and they looked at one another and said, look, He's speaking my local language. How does he know my language? So they were speaking in the known tongues of people. This is not unknown tongues. Why? Because when a person speaks in unknown tongues, what does Paul say? For no man understandeth him. That's 1 Corinthians 14.2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. So what happened on the day of Pentecost is not unknown tongues. They were speaking in known tongues. Imagine on the day of Pentecost. 
all had spoken in unknown tongues. It's in a public place and all are screaming in unknown tongues saying God has visited us. What would all the witnesses say? As Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 14, they would say, they are all mad. So we need to be very clear what happened on the day of Pentecost. They all spoke in tongues. This is the public tongues. It's the gift of tongues. I say gift because it's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be able to speak in different tongues, which Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. He explains that some of the gifts, and one of them, if you see, is as the Holy Spirit distributes it to another, he gives diverse kinds of tongues, different kinds of tongues, not different kinds of unknown tongues, but different languages, known tongues. Do you know Spanish? You don't know Spanish. Okay. Imagine one day you speak Spanish and a Spanish person is sitting there and he weeps. These things have happened. There are people who have spoken in another language, didn't know what they were speaking, but the listener heard and he was weeping and weeping and he said, this is what you said. And he said, but I don't know your language. But this is what you just said. This is the gift of tongues. And it is regarding this that Paul asks earlier, do all speak in tongues. Because if you look at Paul's question, three questions there all related to the different gifts of the Spirit. So in Paul's mind, you all speak in different tongues. What he meant is, not everyone will have every gift because, remember who is responsible for this? The Holy Spirit. In the very next verse, Paul says, all these things is operated and brought about by the one and selfsame Spirit who gives to every man severally as he will. It's not according to your will. You can't say, I want this gift of speaking in different tongues and I'm willing to pay for it. No, you can't buy it. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Cessationists say that this gift Seized. Has it seized with the early church? What do you say? Have you seen it happen? So many of you haven't seen it. So let me tell you an example. Today, Pentecostalism is a mighty movement. I'm not saying everything is right. But when did modern Pentecostal history begin? It began during a watch night service in the year 1900. December 31st, watch night service, people had gathered together in the city of Kansas. And when they entered the new year, an elderly woman named Agnes Osman asked the pastor there, Pastor Charles, please lay your hand on my head and pray for me. So he laid his hand on her head and he prayed. That's all. He prayed. I'm not sure of the details. Some say they saw something visible. They saw a light or a glory or something on her. They're not, they're not sure about that. But what happened after he laid his hands on her? This American woman began to speak in tongues. And people nearby said, this is Chinese. She began to speak Chinese so much she forgot English. For three days, she couldn't speak English. And she began to write because she couldn't speak. But when she was writing, she's writing Chinese. And they were all shocked. They said, this is not a human thing. You can, there are people who can do things. You can force things to happen. But this is not human. She didn't know the language, but she was speaking and writing in Chinese. This was such a mighty movement, it began to spread. People all became curious and thirsty and hungry. They wanted more, they received more. And this is how the Azusa Street Revival began. 
This is the beginning of modern Pentecostal history. Let me quickly recall, how many kinds of tongues are there? Four. Two of them are public, two of them are private. We haven't touched upon the private yet. We are now looking at public tongues. What's the first kind of public tongues? It's the gift of tongues, known tongues. Is it wrong to pray for this gift? It's not wrong. The Holy Spirit will give it if it is His will. But you can pray. I don't have this gift because, I mean, I wanted to, but I remember once I was praying in a certain meeting. We were praying for deliverance, binding the devil, and I was speaking in tongues. And there was a Muslim convert sitting there, and she asked me, Do you know Malay? I said, I know Malayalam. She said, No, 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 Malay, the Malay language. I said, no, I don't, because you were saying, you were saying something, Batu, Batu. I said, what is Batu? I don't know what Batu. She said, no, that means stone, throw it like you stone the enemy or something like that. I said, no. And I shrank in fear because I didn't want to even think I had that gift. And I wish, you know, God gives us that gift because a church must have this gift unless you're a cessationist, and you will lose your desire for the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, the second public tongue. The first one is the gift of tongues. The second one, tongues that are meant to be interpreted is what you were referring to. Okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, Paul explains where he says to another different kinds of tongues and then to another the interpretation of tongues. Is Paul referring to the same thing? No. On the day of Pentecost was interpretation needed? Why? Because it was known tongues. So when is interpretation needed? If it is unknown tongues. So Paul is speaking about unknown tongues here and it is called unknown tongues because it is not known or spoken by people on earth. It is probably a heavenly language, a heavenly tongue, but still it is in public, which means a person breaks out in unknown tongues and a person sitting by interprets. Has any of you seen that? I have seen plenty of that. So here, it's speaking in public in unknown tongues, but it requires interpretation, which the Holy Spirit gives as a gift. But even this, Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, he's setting things in order. So he explains how this gift must be practiced. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 27, and 28. Listen to how Paul puts it. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three. Now you can see Paul is imposing a certain restriction on unknown tongues. Why? As you continue, you will understand. And that by course, and let one interpret. He's saying, if in a church setting, the whole thing now, 1 Corinthians 14 is in a church setting. If someone is going to speak aloud in an unknown tongue, it may be this particular gift is being operated. In that case, at the most, he's setting an upper limit. Maybe two or three people, you can speak in those tongues and someone should interpret it. Now listen to the rest. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Is that clear or you do you need interpretation? <sighs> Clearly, Paul is not for somebody shouting aloud in the church in unknown tongues. He said, if you're speaking in unknown tongues aloud, 
Someone should interpret. If as long as someone is interpreting, then you speak in an tongue, he interprets. But if there is no one to interpret, let him be silent. When he says silent, he doesn't mean shut his mouth, but let him pray so quietly that he is speaking to himself and to God. We can therefore conclude that unknown tongues is primarily personal. Paul is not forbidding in speaking aloud in the church. Paul is not forbidding. He says you can speak if someone will interpret. But if you speak aloud and you go on speaking and speaking and speaking and speaking and no one interprets, that is wrong because you're breaking this particular order that Paul is setting. Obviously, therefore, in that church itself, this thing was going wrong. So Paul was correcting it, which shows Things can go wrong in a Pentecostal church, but they must be put in order. You don't have to say, if something has gone wrong, the church is the wrong church. No, this is the right church, but something has gone wrong, put it right. So, even in a public meeting, we can speak in tongues, but quietly. We are praying to God. We are not praying for people to hear. We are not trying to speak for people to understand. Okay, so that is the public tongues. This is a gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. But now let's move on to the real area of speaking in tongues, which is the private area, private tongues. These are again of two kinds, tongues for intercession, and secondly, tongues for personal prayer. First of all, tongues for intercession. Now Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 26, if you read in the New Living Translation, Romans chapter 8 verse 26, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't... So, he starts off by saying there are times we are weak. It could be physically weak or you're going through some kind of struggle. And then, for example... We don't know what God wants us to pray for. You see, at times, I have been in this situation where I want to pray, I don't know what to pray for. It's just a confusion or a block and we don't know how to pray at that time. What do you do then? Do you just not pray? Carry on. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. So, this is a form of prayer where the Holy Spirit is praying for us, in us, with groanings that cannot be expressed in, in words. So, this is a prayer not in words. We begin to pray in the Spirit, or quietly praying in tongues. But as you're quietly praying in tongues, remember, you will not understand what you're praying, because when a person prays in tongues, he may not know what he's praying. But while you're praying in tongues, you can be praying for someone else. You may not even know. If you're praying in English, you will be praying with understanding and therefore you are going to pray what you want to pray for. But when you're praying in tongues, in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is praying. He's praying with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Sometimes He may reveal to you as you're speaking in tongues, you're speaking in tongues but you may have an understanding that you're praying for someone. You may not even know who, but you feel there is somebody who is in need. This is how you will begin to experience a higher level of this beautiful experience. This particular pastor gave an example. He said he used to visit a particular college, and there was a girl in that college who was raised in a cessationist denomination. That means 
she did not believe in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. She believed in the Holy Spirit. She believed that the Spirit, Holy Spirit is God, but she didn't believe in tongues and other things. But then what happened? He opened the Bible and he began to teach her. He began to show it to her. And as she looked at it and she saw it in the Bible, she believed. This is something you should understand. Don't be too strong in your opinion. It doesn't matter who you are or it doesn't matter how many years you've held an opinion or who has given you that opinion. If you are fixated, fixed in your opinion, the Holy Spirit won't change it. That's the reason why so many Pentecostal churches have gone wrong. Because they cannot be corrected because they think they share the mind of God in everything. Let's always be open to correction. So this girl was raised in a cessationist denomination, but as she saw the truth in the Bible and she read it, she got filled in the Holy Spirit right there while he was talking to her. And it was an awesome experience. But the next morning, she came running over to his fraternity and he was shocked because he could see some kind of distress on her face. He asked, what happened? And she said, I woke up at 5 a.m. And the first feeling I had was pray in the spirit. So I just began to pray in tongues. My mind was already quiet because I had just woken up. I had no thoughts. But I was praying in tongues. And suddenly, while praying in tongues, I felt I was praying for an old man. I didn't know who this man was, but I just felt I was praying for someone in trouble. From five to six, I prayed. At six o'clock, my roommate had a phone call that her father had had a massive heart attack and they had been just able to save him on the table. And when she heard that, straight away she knew in her spirit she had been praying for that man. Did she know that man? Did she know that this man was having a heart attack? But just imagine at five o'clock, she disobeyed the spirit and instead she prayed in English. What would have happened? She would have prayed for so many things, but she would never have prayed for this man. So sometimes we don't pray, but the spirit prays. And this is a beautiful experience, which you can enjoy in the quietness and solitude of your own room. The fourth kind of tongues is tongues for personal prayer. I will speak a little about this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 and 15. Let's read that. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What does that mean? Can you interpret that, please? If I pray in an unknown tongue... Is this prayer? Is Paul talking of praying in tongues? He's not talking of speaking in tongues. What do you do? You think you are just speaking in tongues. You don't think about praying in tongues, do you? Paul is not talking of speaking alone, but I am praying. Prayer is a, an activity. It is a, it is a, it's, it's something between you and God. When I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, remember what is our spirit? The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The spirit of God engages with our spirit. My spirit is praying, but I do not understand what I am praying about. Is that clear? Carry on. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit. What does that mean? I will pray in tongues. And I will pray with the understanding also. That means I will pray in my mother tongue. So Paul says, I will pray both ways. He's not uh, stopping either. He says, I will pray both ways. And he says, you can sing in tongues and you can sing in your own language also. In verse 2, Paul says, when a person prays like that, what is he doing? In the spirit, he is speaking mysteries. 
Now, here is, this is the aspect that I want to explain. Many of us, we speak in tongues. We have lost something so precious if we don't speak in tongues. If you have hardened your heart against tongues or you don't speak in tongues, do not grieve the Holy Spirit because you're hardening your heart against something that Paul practiced more than everybody. When we speak in tongues, we are not blabbering. Do not think that when a person is speaking in tongues, speaking in a, in a known language is better. You think that speaking in a known language is better because you understand what you're praying. But there is a different level of praying where you are speaking mysteries. Did you ever realize that you are speaking mysteries in an unknown tongue? No, you didn't. So I'm going to explain that before I finish. So the question that some may ask is, why pray in unknown tongues when we can pray in our own language with understanding and from our heart, isn't it? When you speak in your language, you pray in your mother tongue, you pray in the language that is comfortable, right? And you understand what you... So why should we pray in unknown tongues when we can pray in our own language where we can pray from our heart? It feels better, doesn't it? Okay, I'm going to answer this question with a simple analogy, but it's beautiful. Are you ready? Okay, I'm going to show you a picture and you all know this guy, okay? This is a little dog, his name is Timbu. And the family, they have him in the house, they love him. There's something funny that goes on in this house because they speak to him in English. Has he ever learned English? Does he smile and nod? Does he understand English? But they assume that he understands English and they speak to him in English. But the question is, how much can you tell him in English? Timbu come, Timbu go, Timbu sit down, Timbu quiet, Timbu eat, Timbu don't eat, Timbu wait. No matter how much you love this dog, your conversation is limited to a vocabulary of around 30 words of doglish. That's it. You can never communicate with Timbu on your level of English, but on his level of doglish. If you cannot communicate with someone, your relationship is going to be very limited. I've been to Switzerland. I've been to France, where the people who could speak only the local language met me. And they came and they smiled. I smiled. And then they smiled a little more. And I smiled a little more. And they made sounds and I made sounds. And then we said bye. What relationship can you have when you can't communicate? Just imagine if Timbu Suddenly one morning, Timbu says, hi everyone, I'm hungry. <laughs> You're going to be shocked. Probably they say, I believe in God. <laughs> Think about this analogy and now let us extend it to God and to us. We are all like Timbu. We are limited to a vocabulary made by man. But God is in infinitely intelligent be. And we have to choose if we are going to communicate with this God, then he must communicate on our doglish level of 30 words or we have to communicate on his level. He wants to teach us lofty things, make us understand lofty things. If we pray always only in English, then that is like Timbu barking and we are also barking with him. God has to come down to our level of understanding. But God wants to speak to his children on a much higher level. So if you're going to speak in English or your own mother tongue, then you are 
going to communicate on your level. But if you're going to pray in the spirit, you're speaking mysteries. You're speaking on God's level. That is the reason. That is the reason Paul spoke in tongues more than everybody. He wasn't blabbering. Paul was speaking deep stuff with God. You want to know how Paul understood all these things? Did he read books? Did he have the internet? No, Paul was speaking in tongues more than all. What was he trying to say? This fourth kind of speaking in tongues, private tongues, talking to God. He says, I speak more than all of you in tongues, but in public, I'd rather prophesy. So, dear friend, when you pray in English, you can pray only to a certain limit. But when you speak in tongues, that is a personal secret language between you and God. Now this has at least two uses. I'll quickly say it and finish it. First of all, Paul talks about tongues of angels. Have you ever wondered why he spoke about this? Does this really exist? Let me give a certain explanation. I'm not saying this is what Paul was talking about. During the Second World War, the US military was having a problem. They were fighting with the Japanese, but they were all the time losing against the Japanese and they did not understand why. The Japanese always seemed to be one step ahead of them. The US made a plan and they sent troops to a certain place but the Japanese were already there waiting for them and many U.S. military men were losing their lives and they couldn't understand how this was happening until they found out that the Japanese were intercepting the radio messages and decrypting them. So, the U.S. Marine Corps recruited a small group of people called the Navajo men and they began to develop a radio code based on the Navajo language. And the code was something like this. They, they used the word lotso. Lotso means whale. A whale is the code for a ship moving in water. Then dahatihi means hummingbird. They use it for a fighter plane. And then chedagahi it means a tortoise, a slow-moving creature, a code for tanks. So they developed this code, and using this code, they began to communicate, and no one could break that code, and it was immensely successful. Now, I'm not sure of all the things that happen in the spirit world. I don't know everything. But one thing I know from the Bible is that angels are part of God's army. Jesus is the captain of the host. Michael is a warrior angel. And we know from the book of Daniel how the angels are involved in spiritual war as we pray. So our prayer is connected with warrior angels. And just imagine, you're speaking mysteries in tongues and you don't know what you're praying. But what if the tongues of angels could be a code language that only angels understand the demons are also fallen angels. They will not understand because it's like the Navajo code. And the spirit is praying to you and instructing the angels. Only the angels will understand. You may say, Lotso dahatihi che dagahi. You may not understand what that is. Others may not understand, but you are commanding the angels. Take the tanks and the fighter planes and the ships. Go and bomb the enemy. Angels understand. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The Greek word for mystery is mysterion. It does not mean mysterious, but it means hidden. It's a hidden wisdom. So we are communicating mysteries, hidden secrets. But God gave us the Holy Spirit to understand the hidden wisdom or the truths which he's revealing to us in 1 Corinthians 2, in the same chapter, verse 12 and 13, Paul is telling us, we have received God's spirit, 
so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given to us. We do not use the words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. And that is why in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, Paul says, a person who speaks in tongues, he's speaking mysteries. So you also in your spiritual life, in your Maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life. Something has happened. You're not able to progress. You're not able to move forward. You, you're not able to understand why a situation is persisting in your family or in your, in your job or something is there you can't understand. Tell the Holy Spirit to speak to you and you speak on the level of the Holy Spirit, on the level of God. You speak in tongues. You pray in the Spirit. When you pray in the Spirit, what are you doing to yourself? 1 Corinthians 14.4 says, you are edifying yourself. Edifying, the Greek word for edify, it actually means to construct a building. Because Jesus uses the same word when he says the wise man builds a house on the rock. He uses that same word. The final thing I want to say. So when you're speaking in, in tongues, the first thing is, you could be speaking the tongues of angels or you're engaging in a spiritual war. But here is the second thing, and that is the language of intimacy. 1 Corinthians 14.2 in the message translation goes like this. You can read it. If you praise him in the private language of tongues, God understands you, but no one else does. For you are sharing intimacies just between you and him. You are sharing intimacies just between you and him. Sadly for many Pentecostals, this is not their experience. They speak in unknown tongues, but their spirits are not in communication with God. They are just, you know, speaking mechanically, as I told you earlier. They open their eyes and look around. See, if you're talking to a person, will you... Take your face away from the person and just ignore them. You will never do that in the presence of someone you are in love with. How does love communicate? Through the eyes, through the words. So when you're in love with God, as you speak in tongues, you're talking to God and you're speaking intimacies with God. So when you speak to God in tongues of intimacy, God also shares that intimate moment with you. And this is the proof. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11 and 12. God says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. God is speaking to the people with stammering lips and another tongue. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. I never understood this verse until I studied it. We need to understand the context of this verse. What does God, what does Isaiah really mean here? You see, the literal context is God is very angry with his people because they're constantly rebelling against him and we also can be constantly rebelling against God. They're God's own people, but God is angry. He was raising up prophets to speak to them, teach them, correct them, but they wouldn't be corrected. Oh, never come to a place where no one can correct you. So God finally tells them, okay, you refuse to understand when I speak in my language to you. All right, I'm going to send you into captivity to a foreign country, to the Assyrians. And there you will understand through the Assyrian taskmasters. You will understand. So if the simple, straightforward message is rejected, God will find another way to communicate to the hard-hearted. So this verse, God is speaking in a foreign language to the hard-hearted people. Now, do you think it is right if I connect this with the tongues of the Holy Spirit. It sounds wrong, but I'm boldly saying this refers to it. Do you know why I'm so sure? Because Paul himself makes the connection. Look, 1 Corinthians 14, 21. Please read it. In the law it is written, 
With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. God was saying, even in, under the Assyrian taskmasters, they are not going to repent. They will not hear me. But Paul uses this, and in the very next verse, he begins to speak about tongues as a sign for the unbelievers. So, the rebellion of the Israelites was shocking, but we must be very careful. So when we pray in tongues, God is speaking to us. And he says in the previous verse, this is the rest wherewith he may cause the weary to rest, and it is a refreshing two things. And a simple way to understand that, if you've worked very hard during the day in summer, you're really sweating, what's the first thing you want to do when you come home? You want to have a shower. And that is your refreshing. And then maybe you eat, and then you want to lie down, rest. Refreshing and rest is what you will experience when you're speaking in tongues Praying in the spirit. You see, when you pray in English, you're praying in your language, your mind is active. You can't rest mentally. You may be burdened and troubled. But when you pray in unknown tongues, your mind begins to rest. I've told you before, researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, they took brain images of five women while they were speaking in tongues. And the results were amazing. I'm not going into the details. You can check it up. But they found this. When Buddhist monks were meditating, their brain was stressed because it's an activity of the mind. But when the Christian was speaking in tongues, the brain was resting. So there is a spiritual rest that takes place when we are speaking in tongues. So if you're stressed and troubled and burdened, you're facing burnout, then the rest you need is praying in the Spirit. Surely, the Holy Spirit will help us. So when it comes to the Holy Spirit, let us be very careful. We should never grieve the Holy Spirit. Let us not resist Him, but let us yield to Him. May God therefore truly help us to honor the Spirit, to be able to pray in tongues properly, correctly, and receive the fullness of His blessing, shall we stand. Father, we thank you for this beautiful time you gave us, for speaking to us, enriching our understanding of the Spirit. Truly, we, we want to learn the right things. There's so many things we do and we, that are wrong. We've understood it wrongly, but we want to do everything correctly. We want to be teachable. We don't want to resist the Holy Spirit, the gentle dove who persuades us. We pray that you may truly help us, therefore, to understand these things. Correct us where we are wrong and help us, O oh Lord, to do what is right. Help us to speak in tongues in, and speak mysteries with you, to speak on your level, to be able to break through barriers of God and receive victory in our personal life. Let all those who have heard the study be greatly blessed that we may be truly Pentecostal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit abide with us all until Jesus returns in glory.